Tonight we are going to finish our series on the Apostles' Creed uh, as we talk about just the last few phrases there. And again, I'm sorry I don't have notes uh, to hand out today, but uh, I want us to begin. If you have your Bible, go and turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. I want to begin by reading a a longer passage at length uh, just to see and to hear from the Apostle Paul of the importance of of a key belief in our faith. Basically, without which, he says, you're playing the biggest game of live action role play, LARPing. I don't know if you know what LARPing is. Uh, LARPing is something that none of you have probably ever done. And if you saw people do it, you probably would think they're crazy. But that's where people dress up like fantasy figures and they go out in the woods and they reenact a battle, like from the Lord of the Rings or something. And again, some of you just think you, you've What's heard that and you LARPing. LARPing. Live action role play. Live action role play. Yeah. Uh, again, it's it's like a big game of make believe. And again, I'm not here to der- deride those who do that. But Paul says if this resurrection thing hasn't happened, y'all are the biggest fool. We are the biggest fools in the world. So I wanted to read about that. Romans or 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, and I'll start, really, um, in verse, we'll just start in verse 1. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins, in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, and to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And by his... And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ hasn't been raised. And if Christ hasn't been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. This is the line. If in Christ we have hoped in this life only, we of all people are to be most pitied. Again, we're just live action role playing. It doesn't mean anything. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man also has come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to the God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put into subjection, it's plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? Let me insert something there. No one still knows what they mean by that. Uh, If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Don't be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. 
But someone will ask, well, how are the dead raised? And let me kind of insert here. The issue is that there are some people who literally do not believe in a resurrection, a physical bodily resurrection. So they're trying to wrap their mind around it. Here's what Paul says. How are the dead raised? Verse 35. What kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. After what you sow, and what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps a weed or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he's chosen, and to each a kind of seed in its own body. For not all flesh is the same. There is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, the glory of the earthly of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. A star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. If it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, the man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we born the image of the man of dust, we also shall bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold... I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised, imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. After all that, he says in verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So that's a lot. There's a lot of movements to that argument. I'm not going to track the whole thing. But I want to just note a couple of things what Paul says. Again, the first big thing is, some of y'all are saying there is not a resurrection. And let me hit time out, pause, hold the farm. Doesn't matter how far we get in this letter. If that hasn't happened, it's all a wash. And the resurrection that Paul's talking about is the only category of resurrection they had, namely the resurrection of the body. Now, I don't know how you perceive or conceive of the resurrection, we might read later on in that chapter, he says the body is sown a perishable body and it is raised, a, it's, it's, it's sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. And you might think, okay, so does that mean like we've got flesh and bones now, we're dead, and then whenever we eat the resurrection, we're kind of just a spirit. That's, just, that's actually not what it means. That's not the, the language here. It's, it's actually technical terminology in the Greek. The, the natural body is the body, it's the flesh apart from the spirit. It's the same language that he actually uses at the end of chapter 1 in 1 Corinthians. It's kind of coming full circle on it. But the natural person is not the person, it's not just like the default or the physical. That's not what natural means. It's not physical person. It's the person who has not been given new life by the Holy Spirit. The spiritual body then is still a body, right? Flesh, flesh and blood and bones and all, but given life by the Holy Spirit. That's the distinction there. So the, the spiritual body is, this, is a body imbued with the Holy Spirit. That's the distinction. There, was, there would have been zero conception of a resurrection that meant anything other than our bodies come up again from the earth. Now again, how that's going to look on the last day, I don't know. I'm going to let God sort the details out. But um, it's important because the resurrection, not just the resurrection of Jesus, but the future resurrection that we wait for is going to be involved in the total defeat of death. The undoing of that bad, evil act that happened in Genesis chapter 3. Not only of sin, but sin leading to death, and death is the judgment of sin. Right, The final enemy to be destroyed, we're told, is death. And that's what 
uh, Jesus did at the resurrection. So the resurrection is important. And, and again, it might seem evident to us, but because we've gone to church, yes, the resurrection is important. To the people who, uh, the, to the non-Jews, I'll say, the resurrection was a belief that the Jews had, but pagans didn't. A lot of pagans thought the body was just a bad thing, right? Especially women's bodies, okay? Like, you know, the kind of the platonic ideal was a male, and women were less because they didn't have all the pieces that men had, right? And again, you think I'm making it up. That was the Greek, philo that's how Greek philosophy understood the body, okay? And so... There was a strong school of thought, and eventually they tried to, you know, once Christianity was on the scene, they tried to kind of hijack some Christian beliefs. It's called Gnosticism. You know, it basically says that bodies are bad things. Our goal is to be liberated from our bodies at our death, and once we're liberated from our bodies, then we're, ex we're experiencing the existence that the Creator, whomever that was, intended for us. Now, again, that was something that the church rebutted vigorously. They had to deal with that for two whole centuries. And that was kind of the first Christian, major, major Christian heresy. So women's bodies are good, but what does Christianity believe about the body? Well, it doesn't believe that women's bodies are bad. It believes the, the womb, I mean, it just happens to, you know, happen to do this uh, lesson, but again, the week of Roe v. Wade being overturned, that the womb is a sacred place, that God knits us together there in our mother's bodies, and therefore they're a good thing. And he made man, male and female in his image. That's not a bifurcation of one being better than the other, more valuable than the other. They're both valuable. And again, it's, it's all tied up in our, what does it mean to be a human, and what does it mean to have a body, the, resur the resurrection. And uh, again, it, it, another, another way we think about this is that uh, God is the creator, and if God created us as humans with bodies, God loves his creation. He doesn't want to destroy it. First Timothy 4, uh, everything that God has made is good, and it's to be received with thanksgiving. It's not to be rejected. So uh, th this relates to our future. We've already kind of covered in the Apostles' Creed the resurrection of Jesus. He rose again on the third day. But uh, this is concerning our future resurrection. And again, you can read of Jesus' resurrection towards the end of all the gospel accounts. But the resurrection was a big deal. And again, I mentioned how out of sorts this was with Greek thought in the New Testament era because... Again, whenever Peter is preaching at Mars Hill and having that great sermon he preached, sorry, the Apostle Paul is preaching at Mars Hill. He's preaching to the pagans. And, you know, he's apologetically preaching to them. But the point that he gets to where they're like, you know, okay, you got to stop, buddy, because that doesn't make any sense to us. As he says, and he has appointed he, a day in time, whatever he will send his son to judge the world, whom he... Uh, I'm gonna. I need to say the language right, or else it's. I'm gonna botch it too bad. Okay. Uh, so he addresses Mars Hill, the Areopagus. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent, because He's fixed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom He has appointed. Of this He's given us assurance to all by raising Him from the dead. I said, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Yeah, that's where they sermon stopped. But there, that is our hope. And again, I, and I think this is a helpful corrective to, uh, again, just any thought. Again, what I talk, you've heard me talk about Tom and Jerry theology before, where you know Tom gets hit by an anvil, he gets electrocuted by the microwave, the you know whatever happens, uh, he falls off the top of the house and lands somewhere, and then suddenly you know you see this little white version of Tom floating out of the body, you know the kitty cat. He's got a little halo about, him. and he's you know trying to pull himself back down into his body. He doesn't want to go right. Um, uh, that is not our ultimate eschatology, but the resurrection, uh, to quote the theologian N.T. Wright, is life after life after death. Heaven is a place. It's a real thing, right? We are looking forward to that. But our ultimate goal is that there will be a new heavens and a new earth. And again, the resurrection of the body is a part of that hope. Um, and it's what we expect when we get there. So, uh, you know, the, how, I haven't even mentioned the Apostles' Creed. The very last lines, I believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, so we talked about the resurrection of the body, but I want us to talk about eternal life now. So what will that resurrected life be like? What is heaven like? 
Well, what, I do need to spoil one thing for you. I've not been there yet, so I can't tell you. Uh, I've not had any experiences. That's right, yeah. Uh, I, I uh, have not had that. But uh, I, let me tell you a story. Um, uh, whenever you see someone at their funeral, you, you kind of see some of the things that were the most important to them. It was mentioned, you know, uh, at David Hager's funeral recently, you know, at the very beginning, uh, there was an odd processional song and they played Africa by Toto. And then everyone in the room, Jonathan was there, they were kind of looking at each other like, okay, this is odd. But uh, it's because whenever he did his sound engineering, whenever he was trying to get the sound of a room, he would play that really loud so that he could mix the room around. And so his wife knew that if I hear Af to Africa by Toto, I know that he's close. And so I want to play that at his funeral because I want him to know that he's close. It's an important thing. Whenever we went to Elizabeth Reed's funeral about a year ago, and I'll be honest, there were some pieces about it that just were kind of peculiar to Jonathan and me. Uh, and one of the peculiar things was she really wanted Somewhere Over the Rainbow sung, specifically at the interment, not just like at the service. You know, at, the, at, the, at the burial, she wanted that. Again, you know, we, Jonathan said, okay. I mean, he, you know, we weren't sure. It just seemed like an odd piece. There were a couple other odd pieces. And then again, it, I, I think I said this last year, it was one of the best funerals I've ever been a part of, independent of my involvement. It was just an amazing service. But one of the things that they shared during her funeral, and she had rainbows everywhere. Don was there. Oh, yeah. Everything was a rainbow there. Uh, and, and, and the it reason... It was great at the mausoleum here, here in Oak Ward, over the rainbow. Yeah. But the reason they, they wanted that song is because she had dealt with some things in her life, dealt with manic depression, dealt with bipolar issues, and she ran a support group uh, for other people. That's how um, she got to know a lot of people. And she would recognize it in someone and have the gift to say, you need to come to my group. You know, people who are going through tough situations, and she's like, I can tell you're, you're on the verge of something bad. You need to come to my group. And that's how she would minister to them. And she would always use the rainbow as a way to describe our hope the hope of, that we have in Jesus Christ, because the rainbow is always going somewhere else, right? After their storm has come through, what do we see? We see this rainbow, and it's a symbol of God's promise that he's not forgotten us. So we sing somewhere of the rainbow, and suddenly it made sense. It wasn't just a sweet song from the Wizard of Oz. It was this thing that meant a lot in her life. Well, one of the books I was reading today, they said, tell the story of a woman who wanted to be buried. Or they had a funeral, and in her casket, she wasn't holding a bouquet of flowers. She was holding a fork. <laughs> I know, it's odd, right? And uh, again, everyone was kind of like, you know, it's kind of odd. Why did Meryl want to be buried with a fork? And um, they said it's because growing up, she grew up in this in a small church, and they ate a lot together. And uh, you know, she'd eat the meal, she'd eat dessert. And when dessert, when after she'd had a slice of cake, she, you know, want to throw her plate away. And her grandmother always said, "No, hold on to your fork because the better dessert is about to come." She's. She doesn't have any life anymore. Her breath has expired. She's gone to be with the Lord, but she wanted to be buried with the fork because there's still something better. And I even think, and this is what I'm going to add to that story, it's because whenever the resurrection comes, we would experience what Revelation 19 portrays as the marriage supper, the wedding supper of the Lamb. Right? One of the things that we have to, I always want to communicate about heaven is the most important thing about heaven is it's where Jesus is. So sometimes we think of heaven, you know, as kind of like this, is it, you know, like, you know, uh, this cosmic theme park that we get to go to and just be happy and play out forever. Now, there is this aspect of the new creation, I think, where we will be playing. We will be living. It won't just, it's, it's interesting to just say, like, if we all imagine, you know, describe what you think heaven is like, we'll probably get a lot of, you know, different pictures. I, from, my, from the time I was young, I always thought it's like this big white field of people. Kind of like, think about like Woodstock, but everybody's wearing white. You know, this big concert, and where Jesus is at the middle, and we're just all praising him. Now, again, there's some images in Revelation where you might get that from, but there's more to it than that, you know? Like, we will eat food together, you know? We might do things, you know? We might even have jobs, but jobs for fun, you know? Like, I think God is, as we enjoy him, we also get to rightly enjoy creation absent from sin, absent from all these things. But back to the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's always that banquet that's coming. And the great thing about it is that because Jesus has come to claim his bride. In Jewish wedding practices, it was common for uh, the groom to have to go pick up the bride. And everyone's waiting. When is he going to show up? 
And there's even a parable in the Gospel of Matthew, I think it's chapter 25, maybe 23, where, you know, the parable of the ten virgins and, you know, the groom, they've, they've got their lamps waiting in the night for the groom to come and five of their wicks go out and they run out of oil and they say, hey, share some of your oil. We can't share our oil with you. We're going to miss the groom. So they have to go get more oil and they miss it whenever he comes because he's come to claim the bride. There's that time that's coming. And I want us to, to whet our appetite for that. And I mentioned, again, I, I read this, I think I read it in one of the books for this study about the Lord's Supper. And I, I just, I never forget this description. The Lord's Supper is the hors d'oeuvres for the wedding supper of the Lamb. It's just a taste, you know, like a cracker and grape juice. I mean, I'm glad we get to do it, to partake of the Lord and the gift that he's given us. But, I mean, imagine if we get a whole feast. I got to have a feast last night. We went to dinner with some friends and they kept bringing food out. It was great. You know, we don't feast every day. We shouldn't feast every day. But it's exciting whenever we have that. And again, what is heaven like? Again, we know that heaven is the place, I think ultimately it's the place where God is, right? In the Bible, heaven is sometimes spatially the thing that is above earth. It's also the abode of God, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. That's where God is. That's where Jesus comes from. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10 that the Son will come from heaven to save his people. That's where God is. And, and what I think is, as I'm trying to piece together the pieces of the Bible, what it seems to be is that once we die, we our souls go to heaven. Right? We're with the Lord. And it's, I don't, again, I, that's where I, it's a reality that I don't, I don't totally understand. But there is a day appointed at the end of time when God will recreate everything. Yeah, I'd encourage you to go read Isaiah 16. 65 and 66. I mean, there's really a lot in Isaiah about this, but Isaiah 65, 66, the um, Apostle John picked up on this in Revelation 21. And uh, again, 21 to 22, I saw the new heavens and the new earth. There was no crying or mourning, no pain anymore. The Lord himself will be in the midst of them and he will be their God and they will be his people. That's, the, that's ultimately what it is. I do think we should be excited about seeing our loved ones there, right? Meeting those who have gone before us in Christ, our, our, you know, maybe our great, 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 great grandfather, in addition to our spouse and our children and our grandchildren and our great, 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 great grandchildren. But the win is that Jesus is there. And that's what matters. I, I, I mean, someone has been asking me this question a lot recently. What is heaven? What is heaven? And I'm, my answer is just always, oh, it's where Jesus is. <laughs> like that's, that's where heaven is. So if he's with us, then that means that's where, that's where we are. And the new heavens and the new earth, that is our goal, is to be with the Lord forever. Uh, a place where we forget our past troubles. After he's wiped away every tear. The creed finishes with this word, which again, we say a lot. I, I think I said it probably for a dozen years before I even inquired as to why we say it. But we say the word, Amen. Amen. Uh, it's literally a word that is in the Greek and in the Hebrew in the Bible. The Greek is they literally just copped the Hebrew sound and they wrote it down. But what does it mean? It means let this be so. I'm putting my stamp of approval on what you just said. I think the ways that we use it are the right ways to use it. I'm not here to say we've been doing it wrong. I think we've been doing it right. But we're saying we affirm this. So whenever we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived of the uh, by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose up from the dead. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting, the life of the world to come. Amen. I'm, I'm putting my stamp of approval. Lord, let this be so. Lord, come quickly. Is what I'm saying when I say that. And so it's not just, you know, this is where, again, Baptists, sometimes we're scared of creeds. I, I, mean, I started the whole series off by saying that. We, we think it can kind of get a little stale. It can kind of be a little, you know, stiff and stilted. And, you know, it's not in the Bible, so why do we say it? It's because I'm confessing these key truths. Remember, it's not all that we believe, but it's holding these tightly. And we're saying this is what we long for. This is what we're about. To spread the, once, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. That people might know the Lord and that we might grow up in Him. Okay, I think that I hear my wife out there with some cookie cake. So what I want to do is uh, is say a prayer 
and, and, and we'll be dismissed. So if you would, please uh, back ahead with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for the chance we've had to, over the past few weeks to study these, cre these key tenets of the Christian faith. And God, I just, again, I thank you for the time this crew has been very patient with me over the last three and a half years as I have, as we've walked through books of the Bible together, we've studied practical church ministry together. Uh, Father, even a huge portion of that time, we weren't even able to be together. And so that's one of the reasons we're thankful we can be tonight. It's because for a year, almost a year and a half, we, uh, we had this meeting remotely. And God, it's such a joy to be in the presence of brothers and sisters. Father, we do look forward to that day. I pray that you would help each of us to live in hope that we would not fear death although we know that death is a loss but that we understand that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord that's what the Apostle Paul said in 2nd Corinthians so father what our appetites for the wedding supper of the lamb help us to have more of a desire for heaven not that we have no desire for here but that we have an even greater desire for where we're going and Father, as we live here, as we await that day, help us to be faithful. Help us to take bold risks, not fearing loss, not fearing hurt, but understanding that there will be a day when all the loss, all the hurt, all the pain is taken away. When the son, your son Jesus comes and he defeats every enemy, including death itself. We love you, Lord. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. Amen. Amen.